Hello and welcome to the Anyone Can Play Guitar podcast. Which gives you, the listener, a series of hints and pointers on your journey as a musical artist. Providing you with interviews from those in the music industry, along with our own experiences. Ben and James shine some light on the many pitfalls and opportunities that being a musician has to offer. Last week we were in Beverly Hills speaking to Sari Dalmar of Concord Music Group. There we covered how to promote your music, publicists, having a story and vision, and being unique. This week, Ben reaches boxer-wetting levels of excitement as he speaks to Roddy Womble of Idleworld about support slots, middlemen, and having a creative space. Hello and welcome to episode 6 with me, James, and him, Ben. Right, welcome to set the scene, James. Year 2000, April, work experience in sixth form. Like do you remember what, what you were doing? No. Is that not the Chronicle? Oh, yeah. Well, April 2000, I was doing work experience at my mum's, and on one of the days, I went out on the road with this bloke who was a fireman, but he did, because you get four days on, four days off, he'd had a part-time job with this company, just like every two, like he did things every now and again. Checking repossessed house, work didn't have squatters in, basically. He had, fire brigade, do you know? No, but he had, but you can have a you can have a second job. Yeah. It doesn't interfere with. Right, well, it did then anyway. It might be different now. This was seventeen years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so we went around all you have about I don't know six houses on the list through like different parts of Newcastle. So right. we got them done there quick. We went, Ben. I don't want to go back to the office, right? Do you fancy to make a deal? I'll drop you off in town or at home if you want. It will just say we did them all over day over the day. <laughs> went, drop us off in town, I'll have a wander around, because Idlewild's album was just out that day, 100 Broken Windows, which was the second album, and this was a time when Zane Lowe wasn't Radio 1 Zane Lowe, or Beats Zane Lowe, he was MTV 2 Zane Lowe, mm-hmm. and it was, I don't know, come on, get this the wrong way around, I think it was, the TV programme was called Brand New, and then it was Gonzo, kind of merged mm-hmm. into each other, but this was when it was Brand New. And this is when you could actually hear bands like Idlewild and see their videos, not on MTV or what they call the box. You know when you have to like put the code in and like, it plays the video that like the viewer request ones. Right. So you could actually hear bands like Idlewild. Little Discourage was out at the time. I think Rosability may or may not have been out, or the video may have been out. And that was a band I went. This is like they weren't mainstream, main mainstream. It was second album, and it was kind of the one the first bands where I went, them and Placebo, I thought, these are a bit different. And, like, everyone listens to Oasis and Blur, but these are, like, mine. <laughs> Not many people like these bands. So it was kind of like a secret club. And 100 Broken Windows is still an album I listen to now, as lo- a lo- uh, alongside the other albums, but specifically that, I can't think of a bad track off it. And I think I've seen Idlewild. I... Didn't see them the 100 Broken Windows tour. So I didn't see them on that tour, but then they released the remote part, which was the, sec- the third album, second one I got into on. And I, that's when I started seeing them on that one a couple of times, Warning Promises a couple of times, supporting Coldplay, supporting REM, and that's what was talked about in the interview as well. He had a mixed bag on the whole uh, support slot. He did, it? Mm-hmm, definitely. Because I've seen them doing this so many times, I didn't see them with the Manics, but they said he with the Mannix and Placebo and Ash but I was uh, yeah I was I was surprised when he said well, I don't think I was surprised in that there was some good ones and some bad ones but uh, yeah true but I just thought because of so many of them I thought like, it, it must pay well yeah <laughs> well I mean there's lots of things that you get into which... I think I was uh, this was probably one of the ones I said oh this, this is Roddy from Idlewild I'm really looking forward to this and again it didn't disappoint so I think what we should do now is listen to the interview so we are backstage at the Sage Gateshead with uh, Roddy Wattenwell here. Um, how are you today? All right? I'm fine, thank you very Good. much. Is this the first time you've played at the Sage? Um, no, I've played um, here in the Sage 2 once before in 2012 and I've also played in the, the big room as part of this kind of like travelling folk review thing in 2009 called right. Under One Sky. 
There's yeah. people like Graham Coxon and All right. Julie Fowlis, Norman Blake. Yeah, it was quite fun. Yeah, do you like, do you like this? Is this I like the building. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely. I mean, ideally, I'd be in like nice rooms like this all the time, but <laughs> I'm sort of a strange artist in a way that I kind of sort of traverse, that's not the right word, but go between two worlds. So like, yeah. I'm in rock clubs and sometimes in, but in folk clubs and sometimes in, in lovely little theatres and I've never been one or the other, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I do, yeah. That was one of the things I wanted to ask you, like, do you think this sort of venue lends itself to your current mm. sound more than, let's say, where I've seen you most at North Newcastle and North Reunion Union back in yeah. Idlewild album tours? Yeah, well, I mean, so it all depends on the time, doesn't it? I mean, like, it wouldn't have suited me 15 years ago, no. this kind of thing. But um, that that around that time, we were much more suited to being in, like, you know, student unions or, you mm-hmm. know, rock clubs or... Yeah. Because that's the kind of music we were making and the kind of people that wanted to see us play. But now, like, largely my audience is the same age as me, or, you know, you know, and they're quite happy to sit down yeah. and, like, have a nice glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the new album itself, is the current gigs are going well. Yeah, well, we released. just started. Yeah. Um, uh, the first night was pretty badly attended. Right. Um, but, you know, the main tour is in October, like, you know, when we're playing, like, you know, Manchester, right. London and Glasgow, and that's, the tickets are doing pretty well for that. I mean, nowadays, for a recording artist, I mean, certainly one like me has been doing it for a while, all you can kind of hope for is a busy enough tour, a few good reviews and, like, a few spins on six music. Yeah. You know, that's, you've got to be kind of aim low. <laughs> that's not even lower definitely higher than we ever got well, you know what I mean, like, I know you know, mean there's yeah. no point in like you know pretending that it's you know there's there's a handful of acts that can kind of comf- comfortably know that they can sell out arena tours and yeah. get support from these kind of things and they do have they have a lot of investment still from labels and but most people I know who play music don't have that yeah so do you do a lot of your own production and label work yourself now or? Mm-hmm. yeah kind of about 10 years ago that started to kind of really there was a real it felt like, like it was a quick, quite quickly changed from suddenly being on a major label and, you know, having that kind of infrastructure of like touring and, yeah. you know, tour support. And again, I had a lot of friends and bands that were in a similar situation. That just seemed to dissolve so quickly. Really? And everyone was left in this situation where it had to be resourceful and you had to either sign to a smaller label or do put your own records. And, and nowadays that's kind of normal. In 10 years, that's become the normal way to do it. And, to do a lot of self promotion on you know social media, mm-hmm. um, you know not I don't book my own tours. I have an agent, but I do know lots of people that do that too. Really, they cut out all the middlemen just so they can carry on making a living out of being creative. That's the main thing, isn't it? Yes, yeah, oh. so totally, and that's what we're all about on the podcast. So, um, if we just go back a little bit, um, one of the things that interests me and James, who would be here, but he's at work. Mm-hmm. Um, interest us when we first started was re- recording and yeah. we were like rabbits in headlights when we mm. first started recording and one of the things we looked at when we were doing some research about what you were talking about in an interview trying to get that live sound uh-huh. and like on your early demos how important do you think the live sound is to pretty much demo the band to either a small record company or a big record company well I don't know what it is like anymore like that's the thing like, when we started there was no Internet. Well, I mean, yeah. it existed. Yeah, yeah no. But, like, we didn't have... I didn't have an email address until I was 23. Right. And we started the band when we were all 19. So, mm-hmm. you know... Uh, we didn't have any money either. So we're all students or working. So we couldn't afford to go into the studio or couldn't afford to record ourselves. Mm-hmm. So there was no... Didn't have a four-track or anything like that. There was no even ambition to do that for until we were, like... We played lots and lots of gigs before we ever went to a recording studio. Okay. I think now you can record yourself where well, you can. Mm-hmm. You can buy a pretty sweet mic or even just a laptop mic and record pretty well. So yeah. you don't have to do any gigs and you've recorded, you know, you record, put your ideas across. And um, that's, I think that's been a real systematic change in music that I can see is the fact that there's lots of people that don't consider going on tour, don't consider to go out and play and as part of um, creating music. Because you can create pretty interesting music in your bedroom. Mm-hmm. And people can hear it straight away. There's something quite exciting about that, in, in a way, and it has sort of changed music. I think the way that you know, music's a lot more kind of programmed and electronic, and all these kind of ideas, rather than when I started, when it was all pretty much bass drums and guitars. Yeah. 
uh, there were people making electronic music, but they weren't doing it on laptops. There were, yeah. you know, there were obviously they, some of them were, but it was very much one or the other. And whereas now all these things are kind of combined in a pretty interesting way. But so when I when I formed a band, it was it was all about just getting gigs, getting gigs. And we so, did yeah. we did make a demo, but that was a, we made a demo so we could get a gig in Glasgow. Yes, I remember reading that. Yeah, because mm-hmm. like you know we wanted to play in Thirteenth Note and we wanted to play Nice and Sleazy's, which are two bars. In Glasgow, where a lot of the Glasgow bands played at the time. Nice and sleazy. Is that we, still there? Yeah. But yeah. we couldn't get a gig there. They were like, can you send us a demo so we can have a listen? We've heard of you, but... Mm-hmm. So that was why we did it. We did. We just made we made a recording just to get more gigs. Cool. And also, another interview we read about um, yourself was... You've just touched on it before when you're in the, the label machine, uh-huh. I guess, and it's single album. Two <coughs> Two weeks after writing your album, single album yeah. tour, and you mentioned that that's great to get back into the van. Mm-hmm. How do you? I suppose it's quite a hard question to ask. Um, is it one you prefer or not prefer? Do you prefer that getting into the van, getting into all these places, seeing the whites of people's eyes, but also taking your time on the music? To see if, do you feel like that? Well, again, I, it, 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 over the course of my you know career, or whatever you want to call it, I felt differently about, about each of them. You mm-hmm. know. Now, um, at the side, something I find something quite like I like being in a van because of you know I've been used to it throughout my life, and yeah. I like I travelled a lot when I was younger, and I love moving. I love that mm-hmm. feeling of moving, and I don't care if it's a, you know we're just in a wee transit splitter van here, and I really yeah. like that. So I really like quite I feel quite comfortable mm-hmm. in that. And playing, performing music, standing on stage and playing it with my band, I love doing that. You know, and I. As you get older, the, all the stuff around that becomes a bit more tiresome, like, you know, the travel lodges and that kind of thing, uh-huh. <laughs> and booking things like that. I have yeah. to spend like days, you know, booking them, and but that's such a small thing in com- you know comparison to the advantages of being able to live a kind of creative life. Um, r- Studio wise, too, now it's very different. I mean, I work with the same collective of musicians, either Idle Wild or my solo band, and they, like Andrews and the solo band. He's got a space in Dundee. Like a yeah. studio space, practice space. Rod Jones from Idlewild, he's got a studio and actually he runs that as a commercial studio but we also use it to work in, in okay. Edinburgh. And up where I live in the Hebrides there's a local library which is, I say a library, it's basically a room by the size, a wooden room where we um, work on stuff too. So I've got kind of these spaces that that's, I can do yeah, it. That's cool. Back in the day with Idlewild it was, yeah, we had a, a basement practice room in Edinburgh mm-hmm. and that's where we wrote a lot of our songs and then we'd go up to the Highlands Quite a lot. We had this house that we used to rent out and set our gear up, and we wrote a lot of our songs for like the remote part and other albums like that there in that house. And that yeah. So yeah, always, it's always been important to me to have a space to go to and create. And studio wise, I'm kind of like I'd rather other people did that. You know, I, I mean, obviously I go in or sing my songs, and yeah. but I, it's for me, it's the creation of somewhere else. It's in these yeah. like you know spaces. Yeah, that, that's the exciting place for me. And then the actual recording studio, the rest of my band, much more keener than I am. I find it a wee bit. I'm not really that interested in gear, you know, right. and and things like that. I'm not. I'm more interested in like books and words. Yeah. So I go and I've and I've all I've written them all by the time I go into the studio. So I'm just sort of singing them, and then well, arrangement interests me and. And that's that's that comes before you go to the recording yeah. studio. Yeah. yeah. So how does the the two worlds differ from when you're writing songs? So if you're writing a new Idle Wild, for example, mm. or solo album, if it's Luda, how do how do the sparks for different areas of your musical life? Well, they sort of merged now because, for example, a lot of the songs on the Deluder were actually intended for another Idle World record. Really? Because we wrote a bunch of songs. Lucci and uh, Andrew, who played Idle World, and also recorded this solo record with me, they came up to where I live in the Hebrides a couple of years ago and we spent about a week and we came up with loads of ideas. Um, and it was originally to go take that into an Idle World album and then Idle World, we did actually record six songs and but there was loads of other songs that I'd been working on as well. Um, and when we decided to make a, a, a record under my own name, even though it was okay. kind of a band record, yeah. we used a lot of those songs. So a lot of the things are sort of combined now. In the past, obviously, it was like, you know, we'd write with, well, basically it's different people. 
Yeah, when I'm work, working with Idle Weld, it's Rod, Colin, um, and more recently Andrew and Lucci, and then obviously yeah. solo Andrew and Lucci. They kind of co- combined because yeah. they go into that tune, and Danny obviously and Soren and Hannah. So it's yeah, but it has largely been separated by just actually me being with different people working on different songs. Yeah, because I've listened to the new album a few times since Friday, mm. um, and I've tried to think of some kind of clever mm. thing of how I can the influences that must have came through because it's like different to your previous sort yeah, of stuff. It is, yeah, and it's it's idle wildy, but kind of away from the last album. Mm. Well, it's like it's, a- it's very. I don't. I can't kind of think of that clever word. But I'm always trying to do something that, uh, different to what I've done before, and I, uh, I, I, and I have. I say, you know, obviously, I've got limits within that because, like, I'm not a brilliant musician or singer or whatever like that. So that the limitation in many ways is kind of a freedom because it means that, all right, okay, I, I can't do that. So if I'm going to try and I made the and uh, in another interview I've done about this record, similar comment about it. it's like you know doing a painting but you only you only got a certain amount of colours to use you know because okay. you don't have an infinite palette of colour, colours it's going to be a certain way um, but within that I, th- I try and do is you know is make it as interesting as I can and um, <clears throat> I, I like a lot of electronic music and jazz and things like that and uh, it's just to get little elements of that into it um, Lucci is a great piano player and has from a sort of more, more or less a jazz background so we were able to get a little bit of that and Danny on the drummer is excellent as a sort of programming and it's got real interest in electronic music too. Yeah. So we're getting little bits of that into the songs, which, mm-hmm. you know, largely if you played those songs on a piano or an acoustic guitar, would be quite straightforward with the melodies. Okay. But we yeah. were, musically we were trying to kind of make, give it quite a broad palette. And because of that, it does sound quite different to other records I've done, which are more based around, you know, acoustic guitars, yeah. things like that, traditional instruments. Yes, yeah, it is full sound mm-hmm. and a very yeah. warm sound. And one of the things I've jotted down here is the ad- addition of instruments. So when I was thinking when we were in a band, we never ventured outside of drums, bass, guitar. Mm. We did venture. We got we found in the studio we were playing in this like thunder box thing. I yeah. made a, an interesting noise. And that's as far as we got. <laughs> so what we going from like the remote part? Mm-hmm. So, fan of oh well all the albums but um that era you can see that was more instruments being introduced strings from from mm-hmm. um hundred broken windows for example and then yeah. warning promises even more instruments what was the decision behind that like if you're a band out there i suppose it's easier now because there's yeah, well, availability we were, those records were they feel like records from another era almost in the way that because they, they were like major label albums with big budgets and made with producers who all had an influence on the sound as well i mean like we were a punk rock band originally and when, you know, for me, the first Captain and Hope is Important albums were still kind of a punk rock band with an, an edge towards melody and like, you know, because mm-hmm. I love the Smiths and stuff like that. So that was kind of coming into it a little bit. Yeah. But at the time of the uh, Underbroken Windows, we were we had a, pr- a proper producer and um, who kind of left us alone for that record. I mean, that record still sounds quite raw. But by the time the remote part, the label wanted sort of a hit, you know, they, they could have saw us as a band that were sort of progressing and becoming more and more popular and they just felt like they needed a hit and then you know so we had songs like American English and yeah. You Held the World in Your Arms which could have been left alone without the strings and stuff and they would have been more akin to something on Hundred Broken Windows possibly mm-hmm. but with the addition of the string section and the kind of and the production that Dave Eringer brought to that they turned into kind of like you know anthemic kind of songs that were on the radio which was really good for the band I mean obviously there was a lot of people that jumped off the ship at that point fan wise they thought right, right they've not you know where they used to be noisy and jumping around and now they're you know writing ballads but I, I for me I felt there was real you know I'm on like I said earlier on in the conversation I'm interested in sort of progressing with every record yeah. in terms of doing something that I haven't done and so work, by the time we got to Warnings and Promises we were quite comfortable you know, exploring that kind of, you know, I loved Fleetwood Mac and Badfinger and, you know, Rod Jones loves Bruce Springsteen and Tom Petty and we were quite, f- and we were recording in Los Angeles, that record, we thought let's yeah. just embrace this, let's get mm-hmm. in pedal steel, let's like get, you know, an Ara George to come and do some backing vocals and let's, you know, make a kind of much more mellower kind of pop record and that's what that record was, with a kind of Californian edge to it, you know. I would totally agree with that, yeah. But then, then after that, we went back to, you know, back into the rehearsal room and made a record, Make Another World, which is much more of a 
back to basics, sort of raw, raw, sort of re- rock record. Yeah, that yeah was, so they've all had kind of different. All the Idaho records have a different sort of eras attached to them, and that's very much the age we were when we made them, and what was going on with, you know, the band's life in terms of. But that kind of broken windows, remote part, Warren's promises is kind of a kind of glory period in terms of. Right. These were big records made with sort of big budgets and kind of big intentions, you know. Yeah. Well, I still listen to Only Broken Wheels quite often. Mm. I think it still it still stands up as. It's got good songs on it. It's got very good songs on it. And that's not just me trying to fan out, by the way. No, I think it does. We still play a little discouraged, even in a solo band. And even if you play it differently with acoustic guitar and a fiddle or whatever, it's just just got a really good chorus. Yeah, it's it's got a good structure to it, yeah. So, (coughs) um, I know I'm jumping back and forth here, but support slots is another thing that we, James Mm. and I, spoke about. Because when we were starting out, we played a few support bands, uh, with support bands. Um for people coming through and we thought that was really important to get a bigger crowd and stuff uh-huh. and I, I would say I've seen Isle of Island yourself as many times solo as I have support yeah we, we did too much of that right that um, was my question my question like we were like I mean I don't actually think it makes much difference really I think yeah. it does if, you, if you're like on a oh, you get a really good tour and you're on the cusp of something I mean you're wearing a Pearl Jam t-shirt that yeah. was the best sport band we, we ever you know we supported them on an American tour okay and um that was the best experience I had supporting the band. Yeah. Um, they had a massive audience every night. Mm-hmm. And they treated you really well. They paid you properly. Because quite often support bands get 50 quid. Really? So, and you, you know, you're subsidised there by the record company and it's all these kind of, you know, yeah, you don't support support a band. To, what, what I mean, like, if, if you've got a record out and people are thinking, oh, this is a pretty good record and you're supporting a band that are a bit bigger than you, you also have a record out and you're quite similar, mm-hmm. and you know that the audience is going to both, then, then it's a good time to do it. And I did a, a support tour with Ash in 1998, and mm-hmm. that was a good one for us to do, because we were just kind of coming up, and Ash had lots of young fans that were into kind of pop punk. We were a bit edgier, noisier, more chaotic, and we just every night were like, you know, winning over all the crowds, and, you know, we, we that really kind of gave us a sort of, a, gave us a, you know, a, a bit of a crowd... That was a good support tour. The Pearl Jam support tour was good too, for a different reason. It was in America. Lots of people, um, they were really nice to us, and we were playing to lots of people who were kind of quite into the band. Yeah. Did you see a bump in sales or anything? Not like really, that? no. Mm-hmm. But, um, and, and we didn't have the money to go back to America to carry yeah. on touring, so we didn't really see that aspect. Certainly with the Ash tour in 98, we did, because we were always out on the road, and suddenly, we, you know, there was like twice as many people at our concerts, and we're like, well, that's because because we were playing clubs. Ash were playing like you know two thousand yeah. capacity halls. Yeah, um, we've also done tours, support tours like we opened for Coldplay, and yeah, the, that was just bad for us. You know, really, the remote part had just come out. We were signed to the same label as Coldplay. They were like you know become, going away on their way to becoming this massive band. Who they are, yeah. And um, their audience was just like just didn't like us at all. Really? We were far too noisy and still weren't you know really used to playing in arenas and. Um, yeah, but you regularly there'd be people in the front row with their fingers in their ears or like yawning, and you know, it was just it was a bit of a slog. And yeah. the band were, Coldplay were night, very nice people, yeah, and they we got treated very nicely. But, um, yeah, you know, that was a <clears throat> Manic Street Preacher support tour, that was bad news as well. Right, Ninety, yeah, it was so we've done, we did a lot, yeah, of so it's, it's, we did a lot with placebo as well, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's hit and miss, really. I guess it really is. Yeah, so some of the things I've got down there are like, what are your tips for getting the most out of it? But I suppose it's depending on who you're with. Well, it's not paid well supporting bands. So like, if you're you know you're going to struggle if you're a band, um, and then you, so you have to think, well, is it worth it? What are we going to get out of it? Bear in mind that you've got, it's a long day, mm-hmm. and you're only paying for half an hour at the most. So like I can deal with a long day if I know I've got to at least play you know I've got an hour an hour and a half on stage playing music you know with my friends at the end of it in front of people who want to be there of course but with support tour you've got a long day to play to half an hour possibly to an empty hall of people that aren't interested in you you know well <laughs> so, yeah. that's yeah. something to bear in mind I mean we've had that quite a lot in our okay. our career too but on the similar on the other hand you know like it can be really worthwhile it can be like you can win over lots of people. And then, so when you do your tour, you, I would always recommend doing a, your own tour quickly afterwards. Okay. And then you can see 
who remembers you. Yeah, like follow the bus around that you've just done. Yeah, the I, mean, I, I, I don't listen to much sort of punk rock anymore, but like that's a real thing in punk rock and punk pop. You know, like they go out in sort of four band bills, don't they? Mm-hmm. There's four similar sounded bands. They go yeah. out and you know, and that's a quite healthy thing to do. I think if you're just if there's one support band and it's there's a the danger of being lost a bit. Okay, so when you've got when you're doing your own show. Mm-hmm. What what do you look for in a support band? How do you, like do you make sure you treat them like Pearl Jam treated you, sort of thing? Well, with Idlewell, we just tend if we take a support band, we tend with generally friends. Yeah, you know, um, because we know we're going to be hanging about with them, and we want to be. So the last time we toured, Soren McLean supported Soren's in my solo band. Okay, so that was just because I knew it was him and this, you know, few of Danny and people and they're all pals, and it was just nice to be around them. Yeah. And we always did that away. We always kind of took support bands that we're friends with. So it would, because when you're on tour, you're just kind of like this weird holiday you're on with people, <laughs> which sometimes doesn't feel like a holiday. Mm-hmm. So it's quite good to be around people that you like. Oh, definitely. Um, and solo wise, yeah, I don't really, I, it's, I just thought it's the promoter normally chooses. Okay. Um, oh, like, like local? Yeah. Oh, so cool, I, yeah. I, I generally say, you know, bands, we normally have singer songwriters because it's a bit easier. Yeah, then they can just sort of turn up and sing for half an hour, and they don't have to. Even if even if they're not getting paid that much, it doesn't really make too much difference because there's only you know them coming down from somewhere local with a guitar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I don't yeah. feel so bad about that <laughs> if they're only getting fifty pounds or whatever. Yeah. Um. So the few <coughs> things I've got down here, I've just got, I've just noticed, just keeping a check on the time. What time is your sound check? Oh, I'm fine at the moment, yeah. All right, cool. Mm-hmm. So um, I've also got down here about the poetry side, because mm-hmm. obviously in all the Idle Wild albums, for example, it says support your local poet. Yeah. We've actually stole that for the podcast as well, support your local emerging artist. All right. <laughs> um, that's, that's all right. Of course, I it's not copyrighted. <laughs> no, I didn't think it would be. So um, how big an influence and how big a role does poetry itself play in your songwriting process? Well, I think poetry and lyrics are, are separate things. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of poetry, and I'm not by any means an academic or any kind of scholar. Um, it's something I came to independently. I didn't even like it at school when we were taught it. I, I love it. I mean, it's to me, it's language that's really alive. It's like one of the sort of purest forms of art, I think. Okay. It's like, you know, making patterns with words. and So, I, I, yeah, I'm a big fan, not of all poetry, obviously, but a lot of it, and... Uh, I read it and I get a lot of it, inspiration and ideas from it that come come from it. I don't write it myself. I mean, I write song words, which are a bit different because the music gives them their meaning. The, you know, I never put the rarely put words into liner notes because I just feel that you know you're better to hear them rather than read them song words. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's massively important to me. I mean, I've been lucky to kind of get to meet a few of my favourite poets over the years. And Evan Morgan, obviously, we worked with him on the remote part and. Okay. Yeah, um, Liz Lockhead I've got to know a bit recently and you know John Burnside I've met and we did a record a few years ago which was um, 10 years ago Ballads of the Book and it was a Scottish poets writing lyrics for Scottish bands <coughs> right so I helped put that together that was really interesting so yeah I'm just a fan yeah I would say but yeah it's, it, it filters through to my ideas definitely in my way of thinking about structure and lines and how I'm not interested really in a song the songs don't have to be about something the way that when you read poetry, you think it doesn't have to be about something. It evokes ideas. Mm-hmm. It's an exchange of ideas. That's the way I think of songs. Um, I'm not really drawn to singer-songwriters that are writing songs about, you know, a particular moment in time. All right. Yeah, I like ideas to kind of... I like songs to be kind of... Suggest a few things at once, almost. Complex. Mm. Yeah. Well, not, they don't have to be complex. I mean, you can be that, you know... Like, there's some really simple songs that, you know, Talking Heads are a good example of... Their words aren't complex, but like you know, there, there's a lot of ideas going on. Yeah, there is. Mm-hmm. Um, Tom Heads are, to me personally, one of my favourite bands. Mm-hmm. And that's a band where you're not a band you'd think you know like of. Do you even think of David Byrne as a poet? Would you? He's just like. Yeah. But his words are like unlike anyone else's. Yeah, it's really interesting, dude. I suppose you can look at that as well for people like uh, Underworld. Mm-hmm. How uh, Carl puts his songs together? They mm-hmm. are. You would think that poetry but mm-hmm. they're kind of not as well at the same time it's very I uh, think yeah I mean I'm music that makes you think yeah I'm not uh, as I say I'm not really I've never been a fan of like other than Dylan sort of singer songwriters you know Dylan's kind of the ultimate 
I find a lot of it, lots, especially a lot of the American stuff, just like so boring. Right. And there's so much, so, 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 so there's just like a conveyor belt of American singer songwriters. Yeah. Oh, in the UK, because in the UK they can make money quickly and they've got an audience and it's small to tour, you know, it's so we just get inundated with these American artists all the time, I think. It sort of depresses me a little bit, the way that, you know, there's not like a Scottish artist or an English artist. Well, there's lots of them, but like, you know, they're not, they struggle a lot more, even in their own country. Uh, Yeah, I know. And certainly there's no chance of them going to America. And yeah, it's, Americans have kind of got it sealed up a bit <laughs> when it comes yeah. to that. I wonder if it's that um, romanticism of the yeah, I mean, 60s, 70s I th- traveling artist in America. To- I think it totally is. Yeah, I think it is still. Um, I mean, I- I've bought into that many times, obviously. I'm not, like I say, I don't like American music. I love American music. A lot of my favorite artists are American. Um, but I just think now we're just, it's just, you're just saturated with. All these bands and like they all sound the same to me, and I'm, I don't mean that. That's not because I'm like some old guy who doesn't listen to music. <laughs> I listen to loads of different styles of music. Just this whole succession of these like educated um, mm. white guys that are just like playing like you know emoting with their guitars. Yeah, it is a fine balance as well. I bet of like, trying to find that artist who might. Struggle to get out wherever they are for whatever mm. reason because sometimes life gets in the way and you're mm. right, the conveyor belt yeah. does churn them out. It does. Um, I'll just do a couple of quick more ones before you head off there. Um, so you, I know you've said you like traveling around, you've got your Edinburgh mm. space, you've got Dundee space, mm. MPD space, and I know you spent time in New York. How does travel affect your songwriting process or how, like, even I mean the songwriting process, just getting the ideas out for albums. Even if you don't get a song from it, it might just be a theme that comes into an album. Yeah, I think everything. Uh, like any anyone that's interested in the creative arts, and that is either if you're a painter, if you're a poet, if you're a sculptor, an actor, a musician, anything. Your life is what filters into your work, isn't it? So, like, if you're traveling a lot and you're meeting different people every day. And you're like traveling through different landscapes and you're eating different food and, you know, going to different bars and all that kind of stuff. You might not think that there's one specific moment that you're going to get something from, like, yeah, like a painting or inspiration for something. But you, it's all in there. It's all going in there, isn't it? And then sometimes. Yeah. Films. Yeah. yeah. And then it just comes out some, some suddenly, a, you know, some thought that, that you might have like come up with three days ago, then suddenly, you know, you write it down or whatever, you know. So, like, I think that travelling's and motion uh, is really important for creative thought. Um, and obviously, being your, when you're a musician and touring, that's part of the job as well. So it's quite good in that way. I, if, it would be quite hard if you were something more stationary, like, like a painter. I think you would have to go travelling a lot to get different ideas. Whereas on, when you're a touring musician, you're kind of... Getting them while you, yeah. you go, you know, and working, like, yeah. And all the people you meet along the way can give you different ideas too. So yeah, I think they go. I can't. I mean, as I said before, I travelled a lot when I was younger. I lived in lots of different places, and so I was quite well suited to the touring life when I started doing it. It didn't feel that weird to me. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Colin Newton, who was a drummer in Idlewild, he lived in the same town all his life, you know, and <coughs> you know, and not been that many places. So it was kind of a real change for him. Mm-hmm. For me, it was a bit more. It's, I took to it really quickly. And how do um, bandmates and such deal with that when they haven't really ventured outside of a small city Well, I've been in a band with quite a few people who've dealt with it badly. Okay. Um, but just drinking too much. <laughs> right. I think a lot of people, it's tough. You know, it's tough because I wasn't bothered about it when I was younger because I was just a single man, you know, like I didn't have a family, didn't have a girlfriend. You know, I was quite happy to kind of travel around. But at the minute, you know, I got, I'm married with a, I have a child and like, so I wouldn't go away for longer than like ten days now, you know. I'm like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Life just changes like that. So, um, it, but you know, when you're young and you're doing that, some are different every night, and yeah, some people really can't deal with it, and that's why I lo- I, I'm not surprised why so many people now haven't spent twenty years playing music and ten of them quite intensely touring. I'm not surprised why so many bands take a lot of drugs or drink a lot because it's a yeah. strange life. Yeah, it's a very strange life. Yeah. So, what would you say are the 
the best part of it and what are Well, I've never been in a massively successful band or anything like that. So, I mean, I've never had like, you know, I do well had our moment in the spotlight, but, you know, largely we've been kind of working musicians, coming up with ideas, making records and, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, I've never had like great wealth or anything. I'd imagine that would be quite fun for a few years. <laughs> but um, not many musicians get that, you know. And when, no. they, when they do, you know, then they start worrying about how they're going to keep it. You know, and all that kind of stuff, and that affects the art they're making. I think uh, I would totally agree. Yeah. Um, whereas if you're just if it's your make you're making a living doing it, then you're kind of like, you know, you've got a more kind of realist approach to. Um, so, but in terms of like, you know, there's too many good times of term. You know, gigs we've played, places we've been, people we've met. You know, I've just had a really fortunate, you know. 20s and 30s have been able to do that so um, cool. yeah, I'm very very grateful cool that's a perfect way to finish then okay. um, thank you very much again no and enjoy the show tonight thank you are you coming down or are you support slots for me I love doing support slots because it kind of legitimised what we were doing it was something to talk about at work as an oh I've been playing with John Power or whoever it was which touring band were coming through and it was like a big deal and it paid quite well well, for us... Did it? A couple of them we did, because when we played with the band called The Maybes, because we broke quite a few down, we got, like, 50 quid, which is not... It's not a massive amount, but it's still, like, more than oh, your no, average... I think it was very venue-specific. Um, well, some we didn't get. I, I think some of the bigger academy-type ones mm-hmm. was next to nothing. I mean, the ticket could have been 15 quid or whatever. Or twenty quid to see whoever the person was, <clears throat> yeah. and you might get. I think it was a pound a ticket, maybe for what we brought, not for every ticket sold. Because that, well, right. that would be horrible. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah, that would have been all right. But yeah, that that's the thing, you know. So if we brought, say, fifty people, then you're still only getting fifty pound, even though obviously that was quite yeah. a lot of money in money made 50, yeah. off those fifty tickets. But yeah. I think it's like what I liked about them though. It was playing the bigger stages because mm. the academies is a bigger stage, yeah, yeah. and also you you never know who their tour manager is, and they might think oh, they they were a bit tasty or whatever, or they might just or they might just see so many of them that it's just kind of like yeah. who's next. I so twice you've used tasty tonight. Have you just, have you just eaten? I have just eaten. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So I get I like I get his point now. Like the more I think about it, I get it. Yeah. Because for me, if I was in a band and then all of a sudden I was supporting Pearl Jam, I know we mentioned that was a really good one in America. That's like that's like a tick on the list of things to do, like supporting a band like Pearl Jam. Not specifically Pearl Jam for everybody, but a band yeah. like Pearl Jam, R. E. M. Coldplay. But then I guess if you're supporting Coldplay and you look out into the front row and people have got fingers in their ears like what he mentioned then it's kind of a bit demoralising as in you do that at one night in a venue and you go it's going to happen again I'm going to get 200 miles down well, the country but particularly if you're doing a tour with that yeah. band and it's become pretty evident on night one that their mm-hmm. audience have no interest in, in listening to you then knowing that you've got another <coughs> 10, 20, 50 yeah. shows or whatever that, that, that would be and if it's not paying well Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, and another sort of valid point that I thought that he made is like, if one, it's not paying well, two, it's becoming evident that the audience of the band that you're supporting aren't going to be paying much attention. That there's not going to be much sort of crossover. You're not going to get new fans Bought out of it. Sales, um, and then you're only getting to play for generally like half an hour. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, then that that's. A lot of, like you say, can't yourself around the country or, or whatever to get well, like nine songs. Very little out yeah. of it versus other ones, which you said worked absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, the, the moral of the story, I guess, is don't just take any support slot. Um, yeah, exactly. Because you mentioned the Mannix. I mean, he did say that was just bad news. I didn't. I didn't push him on why it was bad news. It probably just might be circumstances, I guess. Because I remember seeing the Mannix in '98, and they had Catatonia supporting. And that really, like, two Welsh bands, very similar, mm. they're totally fit. Now, assuming Catatonia are getting paid quite well, then great, but they're def- they were on the cusp of Road Rage and Mulder and Scully, that International Velvet album, which I'm not saying 
bumped to what the numbers it got because of um, the two hour with the Mannix, but that must have helped. I'd have thought so. I mean, I guess the other side of doing a support slot with a big name, like, even if it's you don't get paid anything and it's rubbish, there's no, you know, you don't get any new fans, it's that ability to, to sort of reference them. And, yeah, and that's what and, I was on about when we used to play with them. Yeah, and. On your CV. So, so, sometimes it can work well, sometimes it, it won't. Some people just won't be interested. Oh, well, whatever you've played with, whoever. Whereas other people will be really impressed and yeah. they'll, they'll you know, take it as a bit of credibility. Yeah, and I suppose if you're... Um, I can think of a few bands that we played with that played a lot of support bands and they would always reference it. And I thought, playing that many gigs, support sh- slots, and thinking about what we did, I was like, yeah, that's great. And the more I thought about it, it's like anything that we've spoke about so far. You have to really think about what to do next, because we could, do, like, we did go down a couple of cul-de-sacs. I think. Well, that, that is, it's it's thinking about. I mean, sometimes it's just an opportunity will come around, um, and it might be just a case of just taking it, going for it. You know, yeah, like uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained, sort of approach. Yeah. But then other ones, if you specifically sort of producing some kind of game plan to go and get support slots with whoever, then you know. Give it some thought. Make sure that yeah. have an idea of what you want to get out of it. Yeah. Because um, if it's money, then you might want to try and get sports with certain acts. Yeah. If it's a bit of cross sales um, or new fans or whatever, then you might want to pick other bands. If it's just a big name reference and you or whatever it might be, that there's, yeah, there's just tricky. lots of sort of pros and cons. So uh, yeah, uh, give it a bit of thought. But what that did, I did think about on that was. Um, because I've seen them so many times as at Idlewild and as Solo like that he's very on the road work orientated as well I think if you want to have a career like he's had and even like Maximo when we spoke to Paul that that is a key thing One where, it's probably when you're going to get most of your wage from direct contact with the cust- customer I mean that, that sounds horrible that's saying it that way because it's art and it's fandom but but yeah, they yeah. buy the tickets and they buy the albums and the yeah, t-shirts and whatever he said he tried to cut as many middlemen out of yeah. the process as he possibly can so. and which makes sense it comes down to, I mean if you again it's a balance isn't it you know how much of your time do you dedicate to writing songs your art form <laughs> versus how much you spend on doing all of the stuff that you've cut out the middlemen who would have previously picked it up yeah, and or may that. never have picked it up or I think if you if you look at Roddy's career and Idlewell as a band, because of that success in around two thousand to two thousand and four for Warn and Promises, and he references those three albums as that. That kind of gives you the scope, stroke, like the the, the freedom to maybe cut out middlemen mm. and have more time and spend a bit more time on the next album. But also at the time when they were in it, they had those middlemen or middlewomen to. Do that work, do that yeah. real but graft. It de- depends on the, the person as well. Like oh, yeah. so some people will be absolutely <coughs> awful at organising oh. themselves, and you know, if, I will, <laughs> like I think how many bands have failed because of just organisation. Well, I imagine if, if great ones. If you're on the hook for getting from A to B, but you've got absolutely no organisational skills whatsoever, mm. um, <coughs> and you, you haven't even booked the van, <laughs> um, type thing. Or no other bit. That reminds me when we went to Isle of Wight Festival the first time and got to Southampton and hadn't had any ferry tickets booked. A little bit of prep goes a long way. And I know if you're starting a band and you're 19 and you've got like even just two. So how old you are when you start in a no, no, just think <laughs> 19, I'm just thinking of a good age. Um, you've got like two or three mint songs, or you think are mint songs. You just want to play more and get out more, but I don't want to do that boring work and they're booking vans through whoever and ring and promote. That's, people are going to find me. I'm, I'm the next big thing. Well, yeah, doing that yeah. bit of work, and that's what I think. Work and, and getting the gig in Glasgow. How do we get that gig in Glasgow? We need a demo, right? We'll do that. Led into a career, really. Well, again, means, means, means to an end, isn't it? I guess, mm-hmm. you know, they recorded their music for a specific reason, and that reason was to get a, get a gig at a particular venue that would mm-hmm. only let them play if they have heard their stuff. Today, when it's easier to record stuff again, what is the purpose behind you recording 
something is it so you can get that on the radio for example yeah and if you're recording for that purpose then think about out of however many songs you've got which one you want to be recording that's yeah. most radio friendly like you know all the stuff that Mark Radcliffe talked about yeah um, you know, or if you're recording for you know whatever reason mm-hmm. again I suppose you know whether you're going into a studio or whether you're doing it in your, your bedroom you know, what, what, <coughs> what specifically are you recording this music for or is it just to get people to, to listen to it to grow a fan base or whatever you know so what other things do you think you picked up on so I liked the point that he made about how he's always had a space to be creative um, yeah so I, that that just I could relate to that in the sense not even whether it's music related or or whatever <laughs> I often find if I'm on holiday or if I'm in a different surrounding away from my normal day to day whether it's house you know work or whatever then that's when I can my, <clears throat> my mind just goes into a more creative sort of right mode I suppose and I, and I think that is certainly I, I, I felt like that that can be a pretty important thing and again for Roddy it was clear you, you would go off to wherever they had their space where that could be where he made his, his music so I, I thought that was good. again that's it's not always easy to find a, a space to, I mean even if it's in your bedroom you know like if you want to be playing your acoustic guitar it makes a lot of noise mm-hmm. um, <laughs> imagine how drummers feel well exactly yeah so you know where do you go to, to play to practice to get new drum licks or whatever it might be you know it's mm-hmm. having that space because we just used pretty much the same practice rooms throughout our we did whole so, time as a band I think we used um, one other one yeah one, one session by necessity tried a, a couple of others very you know maybe yeah. one offs um, and that that was our space yeah it worked for us um, it's like a, um, like a like a gang den isn't it yeah sort of yeah but I think what I'd have preferred if that <laughs> and this just comes down to cost really I guess but mm. having our own room so you know part of the time we wasted every week was going into the room that obviously would booked out for that three four hours or whatever it was, mm-hmm. and then you got to set up all your yeah. gear and stuff, um, and then at the end take it, dismantle it, at all well, you know, particularly the drum kit I guess, but mm-hmm. but there was still a good probably half an hour wasted, oh, of, easy, um, just setting up and, and packing away as opposed to just having a space where all your stuff's there ready and ready waiting, for, just ready um, to tune up, yeah, basically. with. Yeah. Set lists on the wall, your ideas on the wall, your yeah. um, mics ready to record mm. something or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, that I think that would have helped a, a fair bit um, mm. in hindsight. But again, we, we didn't have the luxury of having yeah. somewhere that. But then we didn't go out our way to look for another place. I guess we just thought, right, we're in a band, we need a practice room, so we're going to have to pay to go into a practice rooms. Mm. Um, but a lot of other bands all have found spaces for free that they'll. Use, yeah. but then again, if you share them, then it's not necessarily somewhere that you just leave your own gear. Yeah, if you have uh, hundreds of pounds worth of guitars <coughs> and stuff. Right, exactly. Yeah, because I remember there's a club where you and I grew grew up, a lad who's in the band all the time. Um, he, I think his mum worked at the club, and they got the, the um, like there was a bar in the attic, and I never knew it existed. It never got used because of like, work. That? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because hmm. working men's clubs are working men's clubs, they don't get hardly anyone through the door hardly unfortunately so that room was free all the time like literally free and I free <coughs> did not, yeah I did not know that that even existed so it's easier for someone like Roddy who's got had a career and got that luxury mm. of having um, his own space now and it's a business expense at that point isn't it you can use yeah. your advance <coughs> for it or yeah well I guess that there's another thing you know if, if you do manage to make a bit of money off like one song that does really well or, or whatever it might be reinvesting that in the band um, <clears throat> in the form of a practice space that that has everything that you need so yeah it could be a potentially wise move I think a lot of bands have done that I'm but, sure Radio did that do they not spend their advance on building their own studio so they <clears> could just record at any point I'm not sure but possibly I've, I've yeah. heard of, of an or at least read a number of yeah. bands doing doing that, which there's obviously lots of things people will want lots to spend of, the money on when the uh, yeah. Well, there's lots of pros and lots of negatives. Cause I, 
some people will want to think, right, new album, new direction, let's get a new, a new place. Yeah. Like, I think Arctic oh, Monkeys went to America to record a couple yeah. of albums. Coldplay's fourth album they recorded in a very, like, urban part of London, like, industrial area. Mm. Like, you didn't even know they were there. Basically, their biggest album. Well, it's a mindset thing, I guess, isn't totally. it? Totally. But then if you're thinking, like, we have this space, we've paid the money, we can record from January 1st to 31st of December, yeah. and it's not going to cost us any money besides Lecky, mm. then, and maybe, but then again, I was going to say maybe it's a producer, but you can probably produce yourself, really, unless, well, you again, you want that extra influence. You, you will be able to, but again, as as we've seen, there's pros and cons to totally to getting a, yeah. an external person in there. But, I've, but I think that comes back to one of the points Roddy was making when he said um, about... I think you referred to the colour palette of, mm-hmm. of a band and, and using what you have. So some bands might have someone who's particularly gifted in music production. Yeah. Um, they might have studied it. They might have uh, have that in their in their mm-hmm. skill set. Yeah. Um, someone might be good at planning, organising, <laughs> like that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. To so use them, and where you don't have those skill sets, you're gonna have to get them. You know, because if you learn got, quick, well, or, or learn if you've got no one who's good at the whole selling yourself and promoting type thing then you can either try and do it yourself like you say learn it get good at it or if you're awful at it then you've got to look at potentially paying someone else to do it well that's a chunk of money but it all comes out yeah Yeah. you do learn quick in a band though like getting that thick skin of playing in front of people who might heckle or playing in front of no one and then thinking I've organised a van to drive us all this way to Sheffield and people have left where we are because the venue has been, been booked for us. This is from personal mm. experience, you may remember. Yeah. It's like a beef eater. People <laughs> having their tea and we're rocking up playing <laughs> not heavy but loud music. Yeah. They all disappear and you think, that's just us in the mix and blow. But it's quite demoralising. You've got to have that kind of resilience onto the next one. Yeah. So I would say lots of good points in that. For me, that was it. So early on in this podcast, like we're not even out the first ten, and mm. to have interviewed Roddy from Idlewild for me, I was, oh, I loved that. You were, you were very excited. I was. I tried to um, like, No, 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 not good. I, I, no, didn't go for that angle. I, I, I think that's that wouldn't have worked <laughs> very well. But like, because he just turned up in his tri- well, in his um, in his van, drove it himself, yeah. got all the kit out myself. I even offered to help, which I really wanted to do, but he said no. It's okay, mate. Damn it! <laughs> um, Get your hands off it. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. We're, we're fine. But like uh, that whole DIY, cutting lots of middle people out. Yeah. Work ethic because like if I've got a, had a local girl on doing acoustic stuff, she would have got paid for support. Yeah. For support, we went that night to the actual show and it was I would say it was pretty full in the stage two. Yeah. And it was a fair few seats in that. Besides the venue cost, so I think they've gone through promoter, depending on how they've done it. That's it. If he's keeping his costs down, it, it it's extending the amount of time that he can be a musician for, you know. Exactly. And, and extending his career, really, I guess, because, mm-hmm. you know. The, the there's five in the band? Yeah, there's about five of them. Um, yeah, yeah, five yeah. of them. But they're coming out with a, a, a tasty... <laughs> tasty? I heard it again. That's three. That's three tasties oh, in one man. evening. Um <laughs> If they're coming out with a nice pay, like do them ten times, that's decent. I mean, they're cutting out all that stuff and the van hire is probably going to be cheaper than. Yeah, we keep going back to the van as if van is the main <laughs> only but, expense. Well, it's like, like it's, it's like when you were a kid and you get your first bike. It's the whole freedom of like getting away from your front garden. I think we mentioned it in the in the Ross interview of yeah. just like that, taking your art or your creativity somewhere yeah. else and going, here you go, have some of this. Do you like yeah. it? No, fair enough. On the next one. Yeah. Yeah, so I really enjoyed that, and thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did, and we'll see, see you, you next, next time. week. Wait a second. See you next week or see you next time? The both. <laughs> see you next time. <laughs> week. So I'll quickly mention next week's fantastic episode, which is the first of what is a really brilliant delve into music fandom with Mark Duffett of Chester University, where we'll discuss tradition, consistent image, being memorable playing your audience as an instrument and using your music. We've reached the end of this week's episode of Anyone Can Play Guitar Podcast. Big thank you for tuning in and remember to stop by iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from and subscribe so that you never miss an episode.
While you're there, it would be amazing if you could leave a rating and a review. All the show notes can be found at www.acpgmusic.com and if you want to get in touch, email us your questions, any feedback and any suggestions to info at acpgmusic.com. That's it for now. Keep supporting upcoming artists and we'll catch you next time.